In this episode, you're going to learn how to design surfaces for contexts and cultures that are quite different from your current environment, and then how to successfully scale these services. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, this is Priyam. You're listening to The Service Design Show, and this is episode 113. Hi, I'm Mark and welcome to the Service Design Show. This show is all about empowering you with the most effective skills and strategies so you can design services that win the hearts of people and business. The guest in this episode is an ethnographer who has done countless projects all across the world focused on helping to improve healthcare situations across the globe. Her name is Priyam Shada. If you've listened to the episode two weeks ago where we already explored what it takes to design successful services in low tech and low resource environments, you'll know that simplicity is key. In this episode, we're going to dig even deeper into that topic and we're going to focus on health and healthcare related challenges. You'll learn about why it's crucial to take stakeholders along and how to design in a context where you literally don't speak the language. Again, just like uh, two weeks ago, it might sound quite distant from your current reality, but I really invite you to listen for their patterns the, and the bigger picture in Priyam's story and think about how these examples translate to your own situation. If you're new to this channel, welcome, and I'd love to have you to subscribe because we bring a new video that helps to level up your service design skills at least once a week. So click that subscribe button and that bell icon to be notified when new episodes come out. So now it's time to jump into the conversation with Priyam and the cheerful background noise that you'll hear is the livelihood of a day in India. Enjoy. Welcome to the show, Priyam. Hi, Mark. Thanks. Uh, happy to have you here. We're going to continue on a theme uh, from uh, the last episode, but let, let's not spoil uh, too much. For the people who don't know you, uh, could you give like a brief introduction? Okay, sure. I'll try. Um, well, I'm Priyam. I am Indian, but I live in Helsinki at the moment. Um, why Helsinki is a longer answer, and maybe we can get into that a little bit later. But uh, I am a trained uh, ethnographer by sort of history and uh, experience, but I currently work as design research lead with uh, Scope Impact, which is a design social design company in the space of social impact. Okay, yeah, and that's mm -hmm. that's that's the topic uh, we'll dive into uh, in a bit. Um, but before we do that, we're going to do the legendary 60 second rapid fire question uh, round. Uh, just answer as quickly as you can. Are you ready? I think so. Okay. okay, let's do it. Question number one is, what's always in your fridge? Uh, yogurt. Yogurt. Okay, which book are you reading at the moment? Oh, I'm actually reading uh, Jane Eyre. Uh, it's from 1857. It's like one of these classics that I had never read and I found it on my childhood bookshelf. So mm. I'm doing it. Awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, which superpower would you like to have? Oh, um, I think teleporting. <laughs> that would be convenient in these days. Uh, what did yes. you want to become when you were a kid? Um, I think for the most part, an architect. Mm. And a final question, uh, and in this case, I'm really interested in your answer. What is the first time you learned about service design? Um, I think it was about a couple of years ago at my first, well, technically design uh, sort of environment, job in a design environment. Um, and I guess intuitively I knew of it, but it was, I think, the first time I saw it. I saw like an article written about it and I saw people speak about it and that sort of piqued my interest. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, because you said you're an uh, uh, anthropologist or an uh, uh, eth ethnography background, right? Uh, yeah. And that's yeah, not that's some right. yeah, and that's not something uh, that's a very useful skill and background to have in a service design context, but it's not per se, uh, not every ethnographer, 
I, I'm going to stumble upon that word a lot uh, in this episode. It's not a, a common thing to to get into service design. So, um, yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, it was sort of uh, certainly not in, like obvious to most people at first, but I think the more you talk about it, the more they see applications for it. And I think service design uses a lot of principles from anthropology and ethnography. Absolutely. So, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's one of those things where I think uh, where these two fields overlap is where really interesting things happen. So for the topic of our conversation today, like I already mentioned, we're going to continue and build upon uh, the previous episode with Gonzalo and Firik, uh, where we um, started talking about designing sustainable solutions in low resource, low tech uh, environments. And um, uh, with you, I want to dive deeper into a specific topic around that, and that's health, right? Because that's a topic that's mm -hmm. dear to your heart. Can you tell a little bit about that? Sure. Um, I guess I did sort of uh, allude to it a bit when I spoke about what I do currently, but um, I work in the space of health. Um, and what we do at Scope is we try and emerge with creative solutions uh, to really complex challenges uh, in the space of global health and development. So just to name a few sort of health challenges that I've personally worked on are, let's say, antenatal care, in which also means uh, like care for pregnant women. Um, uh, I've personally worked on adolescent sexual health. Uh, and in general, I think uh, my focus has been a lot on sexual uh, re and reproductive health and well-being. Um, and I think uh, it's just to sort of add to that, um, currently with the pandemic, uh, we've had to pivot what the impact of that has been on just even sexual reproductive health in specific, but also health in general. You know, I think people's ideas are changing. So what is, uh, I th the question uh, these days is uh, uh, quite obvious, but I would say, what is at stake? Like, why is this a topic that's dear to your heart? And why do you, uh, are, why are you so passionate about, about this? Um, a few reasons. I mean, obviously, starting out, uh, I think I, most people, we're all driven by something that helps make an improvement, you know, in, in our lives or in the lives of others. And in this case, I think I found a sweet spot where uh, it teaches me a lot. And I uh, see that in small ways, we're at least trying to make things uh, a little bit different or improve things even by little uh, in the areas around us. Uh, the other thing, obviously, is that, you know, with the pandemic, and I hate to bring the pandemic into this conversation, but... Uh, we have to, yeah. I think we do. We can't ignore it. Uh, I think more and more are starting to think a lot more about global health and health systems and what does it mean for one country to have well-functioning health systems and what does it mean for another to not? And how do we address that? How do we solve for it? Um, and those are the kinds of things we've thought a lot about in the last three years. And I mean, my, of course, the company has existed even before I worked here. And, you know, there are lots of people in the world who think about this more and mm. more. And I do think design has a really strong role to play in that what's interesting about uh, these topics is um we'll be uh talking about some examples that might feel quite distant to let's say let's generalize and say the western world but i think the things you learned through working maybe quite remote areas um a lot of the basic principles and strategies that are behind those solutions could also be very well translated into the, the Western uh, health care system. So um, let's dive into that. Um, I'm really interested in, can you give an example of a project that you worked on and what were some of the challenges that you encountered? What were some of the uh, things that you found to be um, surprisingly effective? Sure. I mean, uh, there are many, but maybe I'll go with uh, a single thread here in terms of this project that's pretty close to my heart that we worked on in rural Tanzania. It's a part of a larger project, which was actually cutting across several countries. But in the case of Tanzania, we were interested in finding uh, creative solutions uh, that improve the sexual health and well-being of adolescent girls uh, in specific. Um, and how that started out was that, you know, that's a pretty broad topic because uh, you can improve the, the the quality of life or, you know, care 
and well-being of adolescents in a million with different ways. Uh, so right from the beginning, we had to work really hard to even frame the problem really specifically. That what is it that we're trying to improve here? Yeah. So the question. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm curious. Like, uh, if we go back one step, where did this question come from? From us, because okay. I think uh, our donor was kind enough to sort of give us a, a, a you know a really sort of large and a great brief as that, which allowed for a lot of room for creative interpretation and allowed for a lot of creative sort of uh, processual sort of thinking and room to play with. Uh, so we started to think that, hey, as as sort of the interdisciplinary team that we are, everyone's uh, sort of shared agenda was to really think that we can't solve for everything. So let's find the one thing that we are sort of heading towards to solve, bearing in mind the entire time that uh, no problem is often just one. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's connected to many sort of different pieces and it's a result of many complex sort of interrelated things. But still, you know, just sort of funneling down to that one thing that we'd like to solve for is, you know, as we all do in part, as part of the design process. Um, and in this case, uh, we did that by like reviewing a lot of existing material um, on teenage uh, and adolescent girls in rural Tanzania and speaking with a lot of local experts and uh, partnering really closely with uh, local partner organizations and the governments in really trying to understand, okay, what is it that's currently happening and what is it that needs, um, you know, some sort of an intervention or which what is the indicator that needs to move a little more than it currently is. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I... I mean, the question uh, I have here is, uh, and that maybe that's all, uh, applicable to all the examples you're going to give, but um, you're an organization based in Helsinki, and then you're going to work on a project in Tanzania. What's the dynamic there? Uh, I can. How do people respond? How do you get buy-in from the local community? Yeah, that's a really tough one, and which is where the onus of building that and maintaining that comes on us. Um, because I think, at least in my previous sort of uh, experience working with the creative teams, you know, this is something that like the partner managers do, or you know, where they build partnerships, or you know, at a client lead level, someone else does. But in our case, uh, we had to really make local partners feel like we were in it, and we had brought ourselves up to speed on the complexities that are at play. We were culturally sensitive. We were culturally aware. We were socially sound. What does uh, and that a lot mean? Of responsibility. So how do you do that? Yeah. So that was always a bit tricky. Uh, at times, it meant reading up a lot on what that specific uh, behavior means to the local context. So for example, if I'm thinking about, again, adolescent girls and let's say uh, you know, the high incidence of teenage pregnancies amongst them. We would try and dive into it from a very sort of local literature point of view and see what does, what does that tell us about it. But it also means really finding the right partners that, that also educate you as you go along and keeping your assumptions to a very, very, very minimum where we assume nothing, our tools assume nothing, our hypotheses assume nothing and then uh, we take that to local experts and local partners and expect the same sort of objectivity from them. So I think to maintain that and to sort of keep that as a design principle almost in the way we work with local uh, organizations and local communities has been really important to our work because I think the ethical boundaries can blur pretty quickly. And quite often you have to remind yourself of like, who are we and why are we here and how much do we know? Right. Um, so that that has been, always been a bit challenging, I'll be honest. But personally, uh, this is also where I think I mentioned this in our previous conversation uh, that uh, this is where, you know, we're not the only designers in the project. This is what I keep saying. You know, quite often the girls that we're designing for, we're designing with them and the people that the community members that we meet, uh, we're, they're designing for themselves and we're just facilitating the process. So, again, to recognize that. Yes, you need to know a lot of the cultural nuances and sensitivities, but uh, you don't need to be a master because there, there are already people who live it and are masters at it. You just need to know when it's your turn to sort mm. of step in and move it along the process, I mean. Yeah, and, and uh, if, if I look at the design challenges that I worked upon, you know, 
that's a completely different context, but the principles are the same. You're facilitating the process, you're uh, helping the, the true experts, the local experts to uh, define the challenges, uh, come up with the solutions. Uh, so what were some of the things in this project that really stood out for you in terms of things that didn't work, things that did work? Right. So uh, once we did sort of narrow in on wanting to address, uh, you know, the incidence of teenage pregnancies, we also realized that the narratives that we were hearing about adolescent girls were pretty unidimensional. You know, uh, most people in our sort of preliminary field work were telling us, oh, adolescent girls are rude. They are uh, they are ma badly behaved. They have no focus. They have no goals for their future. But we wanted to challenge that and unpack that a little because surely there's more to it. So to overcome that like sort of one narrative that we were hearing, we designed tools to facilitate a broader conversation. So and bearing in mind again that discussing a lot of the things around teenage pregnancies or sexual sort of behavior or uh, just like, you know, sort of attitudinal um, things are difficult, they're sensitive topics and they're difficult to discuss. We needed to keep that in mind when designing these tools. So one tool that we designed, for example, was just, I mean, you can take up, you, you know, persona building sort of as an exercise, right? But we layered that with local objects and artifacts. And then we layered that with local images of sort of things that encompass a girl's life, uh, including influencers, including um, sort of objects again. And then we uh, wanted them to pin it onto uh, dresses that, well, that girls wear. So it became sort of like a creative building exercise interspersed with a lot of conversation around their choice of those objects and what that means to the girl's life, who this girl is, why is she wearing that? What is she using? So it just led to a, a sort of a, a more free conversation around who these girls are and why they fill their lives with the people and the objects and the experiences that they do. Mm. Um, and because of that, we managed to get a lot of insight into many sort of the different, different, different kinds of adolescent girls that exist in those communities, which they do else, everywhere else, to be honest. Uh, but also that when designing for adolescent girls, that's the reality. You know, that's what we're working with and not just one of them or one kind of them. Yeah, and, and this sounds really like uh, creating the tools to uh, facilitate the process and also going beyond just uh, verbal uh, ways of researching, verbal ways of creating and uh, using tangible things you can point at and you can uh, uh, have a conversation around, right? That's, that makes it, yeah, much more tangible. How, how did the... Um, uh, people on this project respond to this approach um, where they uh, used to uh, a more design approach or was this the first time they get in touch with it? What were some of the responses you got? Um, well, internally, we piloted it a lot based on the people that had traveled to the contexts uh, that we were working with. But we also then leaned on our local partners to really sort of comment on, on the sort of the, the course of the discussion on whether or not these were feasible to carry out. But then again, I want to remind or sort of bring back into the conversation maybe what I said earlier about how... Um, it's, it's also the course that the conversation takes. It's also what people share back with us that ends up shaping it. You know, it's as much their design process as it is ours. So um, what ended up happening was that it wasn't anticipated, but older women responded to these dresses a lot better than younger girls did. Yeah. Because I think it gave them a chance to really uh, creatively express what they weren't able to express as young girls and creatively express their observations of the girls from around them in a way that didn't make them feel the need to be the judgmental aunties that they were sometimes being or be the doting mothers that they were sometimes being or being the role model grandmas that they were being. You know, it just allowed them to be women to the girls around them. And I think that to me was really powerful. If you look back on this project, what's the thing that you're most proud of? Um, a few things. I think hmm. first, uh, like how uh, our tools were really able to uh, to get us to engage the right way with our sort of community members and our participants and always uh, 
putting us at sort of an unequal footing where of course i'd go in with a discussion guide in hand but the discussion was very much co-shaped as i said the second thing is also like one of our other tools that we use for research uh, was again to discuss uh, some even tougher topics to discuss like events that happen in girls lives that tend to derail them and these events can be pretty sensitive you know they can be the loss of a parent they can be you know loss of an income they can be getting sexually assaulted they can you know a wide range of you know sort of life stuff and other stuff but where we were able to take learning from both of these is that we were able to represent that in the solutions we created um and interestingly enough the solutions were designed keeping the needs of the girls in mind but they were actually designed for the local government to use and to roll out as part of like their complex sort of system uh, of uh, governmental sort of mm. layers and interventions and and really sort of we for the second half of the project basically we work closely with local government members to really work see how what it is that would aid them in addressing these needs that we were able to find in the first part of the pro- project yeah right because that's eventually uh, how we started this conversation it's a uh... As a maybe a low tech, low resource environment, uh, sensitive topics, and then how do you design solutions in a way that actually get embraced by the people who you're designing for? And uh, what you're saying here is working with the people in government, for instance, who need to provide the environment, who need to create the context and environment that enables these solutions. Mm-hmm. And yeah, how was absolutely. that? How was how how was it? Work? Because working with uh, the local communities and let's say the end users and the the, the context of the end user, that's one thing. But um, uh, having uh, a stakeholder like a, a government entity, getting them to understand this way of working and uh, the solution that you're putting forward is a completely different thing, right? How how did that work? Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Uh, What I would say is that they actually enjoyed it. I think it's very rare that they come into contact with uh, with real sort of like findings which are not in the form of, uh, you know, sort of, let's say, quantitative data or in the form of reports. So what they were getting from us were, were narratives. What they were getting from us were um you know sort of like softer needs and but then again what we prepped also in order to get their attention was we mapped what it is that they're currently doing and how could the things that we're finding fit into that so it needed a bit of sort of like uh, laying it out um for them and i will say it there was a lot of relationship building that went into it you know there were times when at the end of a long field trip to tanzania we would go to meet members of the government to give them an update, you know, as tiring because they were often in a different part of the country. Because I think when you're working with extremely busy uh, sort of establishments like the government and extremely complex and bureaucratic ones, you have to pay respect to that sort of need of communication and and sort of uh, expressing your involvement a certain way. And and we worked hard at that. And is that maybe uh, a key part of the design process that uh, a lot of people overlook like it like the relational the relationship building maybe doesn't feel like part of the design process but if your goal is to create impact it actually is it absolutely i i couldn't agree with you more i'm laughing because we had so many uh, discussions amongst like the designers on this project including me where we said but why do i need to go to meet uh, this head of government you know surely someone else can do that i'd much rather continue to be on field co-designing testing um but you know when we heard it directly from the horse's mouth so to speak it changed things for us when we understood the the bureaucratic sort of expectations or resource limitations we think we absorb that information differently because we were working closest with the designs yeah yeah and that's the uh, that's a theme that has been coming up on the show quite often where uh having empathy for uh, in this case it's not per se the client but uh let's say if the government is the one who is going to implement this uh they could be the client having empathy for them as well seeing them as people and their, with their needs with their uh with their pain points with their uh things that keep them awake 
really enables us to that that's the that's the thing we often overlook when we design solutions. We are so focused on the end user, while the people who need to enable these solutions, um, they also need to fit into this context. Yeah, that, and that's, I that's what I hear you saying, at least. Absolutely. And I would just sort of rephrase that to say that for us, the government folks ended up becoming users as well, mm. because the solutions that we ended up designing were actually like a three-part sort of modular toolkit for for local government officials, uh, where the girls were not actually the focus of it. The focus was very much around what it is that they need to run uh, all five of those solutions, which sort of part of the constellation uh, of their world it sits within, and what do they need to keep it sustainable? Uh, because the needs from a girl's point of view, uh, no one argued with that, because I think these are long-standing challenges. But we realized pretty quickly that the convincing was actually needed, or rather the, the designing was also needed to make it happen. Hmm. Uh, do you have a different example where... Uh... Where maybe where things were even more challenging? <laughs> um, maybe I don't know if challenging is the right word, but uh, I did work on a project uh, where we basically designed uh, like a group uh, pregnancy counseling experience. It's called group antenatal care sessions uh, for uh, for three different uh, cultures and countries, actually. Uh, I wasn't a part of the first one. The first one was in Uganda, even before I joined this company. But uh, when I joined, uh, our client, uh, in which case our donor, was uh, interested in taking it to Kenya. And then eventually we took it to Guatemala. Now, the challenge slash most interesting piece of that work for me was the fact that these cultures are extremely different. From yeah, one it, it sounds, when you say something like this, like taking it from, <laughs> yeah. to Kenya, taking it to Guatemala, I'm like, <laughs> how that, that's uh, that feels yeah. like completely different worlds right yeah and they are they absolutely are but here's when you know uh here's where the processes i spoke of earlier you know bringing yourself up to speed to a certain extent matter but then again uh i think we adopted a more agile approach in this project where we went in with uh, what we had created in the other countries even just to sort of prototype and co-design further with people there directly um, uh, pretty early on. Like we spent some time doing design research and understanding some basic uh, sort of differences and made those quick adjustments to our, our service journey. We made those quick adjustments to our tools. Like for instance, uh, in Kenya, we used a calendar with, uh, you know how uh, pregnancy apps use uh, fruits to tell a woman uh, or like the parents about like how the baby is growing. We used uh, sort of metaphors like that to refer to how the fetus is growing in Kenya. But in Guatemala, even while doing our desk research, we realized that that's probably not going to work. Uh, we should probably just stick with more realistic sort of uh, illustrations of how a fetus grows. And that worked out perfectly well. But to me, as like a third person who belongs to neither of those cultures, I was just like, how do we make that decision? But again, we don't. The people it, in yeah. those communities do. Yeah, yeah, and and the key is to uh, involve them from uh, early on. Maybe that's. Uh, I'm curious. <clears throat> Sometimes the challenge in um, the design process is when you are too similar to the end user, you uh, eventually end up imposing your own ideas about what the uh, needs, desires are. Like I think that's that's one of the challenges we're making personas or user profiles. If I do that in the Netherlands, I, I already have so many assumptions and biases. When the end user is so different from yourself, then um, like the humbleness comes maybe more naturally. And that's a, that's a question. Um, yes, I work a lot in India as well, and I always have. Uh, so, but maybe I'll, I'll answer that a little differently using actually two things that anthropology taught me. Uh, one is, um, uh, you know, sort of this idea of leaning on a balance between an emic and an etic perspective. So one is like emic is when it comes from within. 
uh, the culture that you're designing for or, well, in anthropology or other social sciences you're studying. Uh, and ethic is when you look at it from the outside in. Uh, and I think that it's really important uh, in the work we do, whether it's in your own culture, community, or your country, uh, or in the work that I currently do, to have a balance between the both. Because if, even if you're incapable of doing the emic part of it, get someone else to sort of bring you up to speed. Uh, but I think for a cross-cultural or comparative point of view, looking at it from the outside is extremely important too. And and uh, there are ways to sort of like build that, that sort of that objectivity. That is the other thing that the social sciences teach you a lot about, which is um, about how, how are you like uh, objective to the thing that you're studying without letting your subjectivity affect uh, how you're viewing it. Mm. Maybe a little bit more uh, background into social science would be a good thing uh, for a lot of service designers, including myself. <laughs> uh, but getting back to Guatemala, what happened there? Right. So as I said, like, you know, some people would view that as a challenge. For me, that was the most interesting part of the project where uh, we saw a few things that worked out really well in Kenya, for example, we observed in the early sort of simulations of these uh, group sessions that we did that uh, it was really natural for the nurses and the mothers to hold hands and start to pray before they started the session. So uh, we were working with indigenous Mayan communities in uh, Guatemalan highlands, and we weren't entirely sure if praying together or singing together is even a part of their culture. but we tried to ask a few people about it, but pretty much on like less than half into the first day of field work, everyone was just like, you want us to sing? And we were like, mm -mm, we don't want you to do anything. So, you know, we can skip that completely. Um, and more than anything, for me, personally speaking, the language was a huge barrier because I don't speak any Spanish and uh, I certainly don't speak the two sort of local languages um, that were being sort of spoken there, which uh, Kiche and uh, Ma, I think, uh, and our local partners, that's when they sort of stepped in. And this is when, you know, I think you were asking me earlier on what uh, uptake of HCD uh, or like, you know, sort of ease with the processes and why that matters and how people responded. I think one thing we want to make sure right from the get go is that our local partners are on board with the things we are suggesting. Yeah, yeah. And that's so key because um, we are not the experts in, in usually in the matter that we're talking about. In this case, you had done uh, the project in two different areas so that you might become a uh, subject expert at some point. But usually we're stepping in into an area where we're unknown. We're, we're known with the design process and then we have to sort of extract the knowledge from the local communities and the, these local partners, whether they are an NGO in Guatemala or maybe uh, the, the finance or HR department in your organization working closely with those people and making them not only as a, uh, uh, a research subject, but a tr true partner, I guess. Uh, that's the key to success. Maybe, uh, what have you found is the thing that helps to make these other organizations feel like a partner in the project? Yeah, I was just thinking that as you were speaking, um, I think what's really helped is to have them be a part of the transformation process. So, for example, if, you know, someone from the local partner organization said something particularly interesting, one way of doing it is that sort of like holding on to it, going back to our drawing boards and creating something with that. But what we have tried to do more and more of is to think of the solution in that moment with them. And I think for them to see the transformation of that information into an idea seed and then into a concept, if at all, and then like being combined with something bigger, greater, better. Uh, it's been really, really enriching, both for us and I think uh, for some of our partners as well. And then, of course, I think like sometimes uh, we've been challenged, you know, by our partners because um, they don't see the value of going to field with half concepts, for example, because let's be sort of let's remember in this moment that the world of global health and international development has a lot of programs running. You know, they have a lot of interventions running in field. These interventions and programs are highly tested. They are highly like, you know, uh, well piloted. Um, and then for our sort of design oriented processes appear a bit less robust in comparison. But I think to really sort of 
Again, this is where partnership building comes in, where you want to just get them to take the first few steps with you, see the process move forward, you know, point out the small sort of slivers of ideas or that sort of silver linings that are sitting within like the conversations and then working it out together. So I think um, taking them together is effortful, but it's extremely important. Yeah, it, it's effortful, but it is the process. Like that's that's the work. And uh, so. I, just like with what you said, relationship building uh, with the people who need to enable the solutions, that is the work. Like we should embrace it and um, rather than feel that that it's a burden. And I think um, it's been stated quite often, but the design process is a is often a very ex uh, experiential process. You have to be in it to feel the value as as abstract and as vague and as soft as that might sound, but um, it doesn't help when you sort of take the results, close the curtain, and then come back with uh, an an idea. Okay. Like it, like you said, the the transformation has to happen by going uh, through the process. So, okay, let's let's get back to Guatemala one more time. Where, where what I'm hearing you basically describe is how to scale solutions, and that's uh, of course a thing that we have been hearing a lot in service design. Like we have a solution a service that works here but how do we scale it onto uh more users more areas and we're talking about getting stuff from kenya to guatemala it's it's maybe um more contrast but the, the principles are probably the same so again let's get back to guatemala where were we <laughs> Right. So I think just in terms of if I were to compare both the service journeys, you know, uh, we had to design uh, for completely different sort of resource constraints. We had to design for completely different uh, social uh, dynamics, let's just say, because uh, the experience of a pregnant woman going for antenatal her antenatal care visit in Kenya is quite different from a local woman in the Guatemalan highlands going for hers. Uh, just as off the top of my head, women in Kenya tend to, or in the part of Kenya that we were working in, tend to come on their own. But in the Guatemalan highlands, they often came with not only their own kids, if they have other children already, but also with like, a, you know, sort of a a plus one. So it could be their partner, it could be their sister-in-law, it could be someone. So just purely in terms of space making and place making, uh, it has serious implications, you know. So as like, you know, designers on field, we were taking quick notes and we were reorganizing the space. Okay, instead of seven people, we have 13 or we have instead of 13, we have 30. Um, so stuff like that would happen. And then one of the other things that I found particularly sort of interesting was how, you know, if a society or a culture have certain sort of uh, conflicts at the heart of it, which in this case was that the healthcare workers, the nurses, were not viewed very well by the women that were coming to the facilities because they've all either had personal bad experiences in the past or they've heard of other women as having had really sort of disrespectful experiences with healthcare workers. And that's a sort of a perception that the service journey had to deal with up front and center. Um, and I think anyone listening to this would agree that to design for, to solve or to correct health perceptions is, is an almost like impossible thing, but what you can do is acknowledge it, um, which is what we tried to do. Uh, through certain small measures, like just off the top of our, my head, what I can remember is the nurses would normally wear their nurse outfits. Uh, but what we requested they do is there's a certain fabric uh, that uh, indigenous Mayan women wear as like skirts. Uh, and it's like a woven, like um, it's a specific weave from that part of the world. So we, we tried to infuse that in the outfits that, uh, or like the apron, we gave them like a service uh, sort of tool of an apron where they could stuff some of the materials into. And we made that apron out of the local material just to, uh, it's, it's a small gesture, but just to build some acceptability and some relatability. I, I think, and that's what we heard also in the previous episode, that the solutions uh, we seek it's it's not about how complex or how fancy they are. It's about how impactful they are. And if wearing a different apron does the job, then wearing a different apron do does the job. And I think uh, it's it's good to remind ourselves 
that sometimes the, the best solutions are the most simple solutions. The challenge often we face is that we have to deal with an uh, outside world that uh, perceives the, these solutions as um, too simple or too easy or might say, well, I could have come up with that in an afternoon. Like that's the, that's the, um, that's the bias we're fighting against, but uh, yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, and as uh, again, designers and creatives and other people that are part of uh, our team at Scope, we felt that way constantly where we want to be cutting edge, you know, where you want to try and see how artificial intelligence or something that's great and exciting and can do great things for, you know, all causes uh, is available to us. But it doesn't, it's it's not needed. Yeah, uh, and, and the problem yeah. at hand can be solved by something that the community has come back to us with, which is a yeah. lot more intuitive, yeah. which is a lot more acceptable. Yeah. So yeah. we should and go that, with that. Yeah, that, that's a general thing that we're not going to solve quite uh, quickly, but it's the value of simplicity that's not value. Uh, <laughs> What's that? And yeah, go sorry, ahead. and just no, to add, and, and that's not to say that, like, you know, a lot of uh, now, certainly, especially with 2020, and you know, the sort of the leapfrogging that technology and uptake of that has seen in, in sort of all regions of the world, uh, we might have a different sort of solutioning canvas next year when, if and when we decide to engage with communities again, because if phones are more available, sure. if you yeah. know, internet has picked up. Uh, a lot more than it currently is, then I might be speaking a different tune, or you know. So, well, but... in, in all cases, it's coming up with solutions that fit the environment, and that's the key. It's not about coming up with solutions that use the fanciest technology, but really fit the environment, are and have a, a realistic chance of uh, being sustainable, making an impact. Um, what would you say is the biggest lesson you took away from uh, this project? Um, my biggest lesson was to, uh, avoid any assumptions, uh, to, to prototype and simulate experiences as early as you can in the process and expose the people that you're co-designing with to that experience quite early on in the process. Mm. So I don't know if I mentioned this, but we never did traditional design research for this project. We only started with simulations of these group sessions where we actually train nurses and while training the nurses the questions that came up that helped us make that training process better while running the uh, sort of the antenatal care experiences we learned how to make that better we noticed the things that were awkward we noticed the things that happened on its own and those were like and of course we would supplement it with like more interviews etc but i think seeing people or sorry helping people see the experience early on helped us see how they relate with it and how, how it fits within their world and how it can be made better. Um, and then thirdly, my biggest takeaway was uh, excellent local partnerships. Uh, you know, you need those. I would have, we would have never been able to do any of the stuff that we did in this project if it weren't for the ownership and the sort of the, the, the support that we got from our local partners. What is the thing that you'd say um, is the is there a general uh, key takeaway that people who are listening and watching to this episode and maybe are in a completely different context um, can take away from it? So I I'm working at a telecom operator in I don't know Croatia, and if we would have a conversation, which what what lesson would you share with me? What do you think I could take away from your experiences? Um, I think the one thing, and I, I, I'm not very good at giving like <laughs> career advice, but what I would say it's changed for me personally is it's taught me to think about results in a very different way. Uh, I think in my previous uh, experiences I'm used to shorter projects I'm used to seeing the thing that I'm creating whether it's a report or whether it's a solution right at the end of it but uh, you know the kinds of topics we work with are sort of long haul you know it takes a while for the for the you know it's for things to even change even a little 
And I think what that has taught me is the belief in simpler solutions, as we discussed, uh, of incremental changes versus like big changes. And I do think that has a lot of value no matter what sort of work you're doing, because I think quite often a source of project frustrations can be not knowing how to do the big thing, but uh, we often lose sight of the small things that we can do to get to the big thing. And that's something that I hold close when uh, I work on the projects that we work on. Mm. And and if I can dig into that for uh, one final minute, how do you measure progress for yourself? How do you know that you're actually creating an impact? I, well, that is another actually topic on its own. But, uh, I know. <laughs> what I will say, <laughs> but what I will say is that uh, on a personal level, of course, you, you know, create milestones uh, as you would just to see a project moving forward. If you're like leading a project or if you're in like sort of seeing how it comes together, but even at like a higher level, um, I think uh, what at least our organization had try, has tried to do now is put an impact framework in place where we hold ourselves accountable for uh, putting together a sort of, a, it's called a theory of change in the global health and development world. And we've sort of adapted that to how we approach designing for solutions as well. And I know it sounds uh, a little too complex for now, but as soon as sort of we were all introduced to it, it's actually the most intuitive way to think about like how, what are we getting towards? Like what is the big picture uh, vision that we want to achieve, which is a big change we want to see in the world, let's say. And what are the smaller ways to get there? Who's going to help us get there? Um, and what do, what are some of the assumptions that are at play here? So just these are some of the things and I think what that does for us at a project level or, you know, task level is that everything becomes attached to a certain thing that helps us create that big change. So it it makes you want to work on it harder and it makes you want to make sure it gets done so you can move on. Mm. And and that's maybe a challenge in a lot of uh, uh, commercial and corporate contexts that you have no clue why you're actually doing it. You're you're doing it because, <laughs> I don't know, three months ago, the CEO put it on the agenda. But yeah. Anywho, yeah. Uh, yeah, if people want to continue this conversation with you, what's the best way to get in touch? Um, I'm very LinkedIn friendly. I am extremely reachable on email. Um, and I can share that uh, with you, Mark. And I mean, oh, you have yeah. my details already. Yeah, so yeah. The LinkedIn uh, profile will be in the show notes of this episode. Yeah. Uh, thank you for for sharing your uh, experience, your stories. Uh, I'm always um, amazed in how much parallels there are in the design process across across the globe, no matter which challenge we're trying to solve. And I think uh, it's really good to hear. Uh, to hear that so uh, thank you again for sharing that i really hope you enjoyed this conversation with priam and that you were able to translate some of her stories to your own context if you know somebody who needs to hear these stories as well grab the link and share this episode with them that way you'll help to grow the service design show family and that helps me to invite more guests like priam here on this show for you if you want to continue learning about skills and strategies that help you to design services that win the hearts of people and business, make sure to check out this video because we're going to continue over there.